chapter 8. The Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with an ordinary pen, Meir Shalal Hashbaz. So I called in Uriah the priest, and Zechariah son of Jeberkiah, as reliable witnesses for me. Then I made love to the prophetess, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Meir Shalal Hashbaz. For before the boy knows how to say, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the plunder of Samaria will be carried off by the king of Assyria. The Lord spoke to me again, Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, and rejoices over Rezin and the son of Hermalia, therefore the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty flood waters of the Euphrates the king of Assyria, with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, and sweep on into Judah swirling over it, passing through it and reaching up to the neck. Its outspread wings will cover the breath of your land, Emmanuel. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Prepare for battle and be shattered. Devise your strategy, but it will be thwarted. Propose your plan, but it will not stand, for God is with us. This is what the Lord says to me with his strong hand upon me, warning me not to follow the way of this people. Do not call conspiracy everything this people calls conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear, and do not dread it. The Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem he will be a trap and a snare. Many of them will stumble. They will fall and be broken. They will be snared and captured. Bind up this testimony of warning, and seal up God's instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust in him. Here am I, and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. The darkness turns to light. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light in them. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward, will curse their king and their god. They will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. This is an amazing chapter. Um, that's basically telling us to trust in the Lord of Heavenly Armies, the Lord Almighty, the Holy One of Israel, and what happens when we do not. Um, it's a strange twist at the end of chapter 8 there, the darkness turns to light. Uh, makes me wonder who was consulting mediums about this point in time. There had to have been somebody there doing such for the Holy Spirit to have that thrown in at the end. Uh, there's an amazing twist in here. Um, there's a gap in the commentary here in this uh, rather extensive Bible that I just that I'm reading from here. It's and I, I started going down a rabbit hole and it led me to an awesome revelation. All praise, glory, and thanks belong solely unto you, Jesus Christ, Yeshua Hamashiach, the Lord Almighty. All praise is yours. Um, when he led me to this, I just I was amazed and I hope you will be too. Um, we'll cover that when we get there. As as we've been going through, we'll do this NIV commentary. We'll look at the Matthew Henry and the life left. Um, all right, so let's get started. 8 1 through 8, 8 22. Isaiah and his children as signs. This segment of the larger section, 7 1 through 9 7, continues to focus on the immediate portent of the sign in 7 14, which is, He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. God being with us, is not a positive thing if we refuse to trust in him. God being with us. Now that's that's an amazing twist there. Sorry to go off already, but we see in verse 8, 8, 
the word Emmanuel. Now we know, we've covered this before, Emmanuel means God. God is with us. And we see it again, right here, spelled out for you in chapter 8, 8, the word Emmanuel, and at the end of verse 10, for God is with us. That's exactly what that is, Emmanuel. Anyway, getting back here. Um, God being with us is not a positive thing if you refuse to trust him. Trust him. In that case, his presence will become a stumbling block rather than a sanctuary. 8, one through 8.10, the sign of Mer Shalal Hashbaz. On the meaning of the name, oh, we see that in the Matthew Henry context, so we'll skip over that right now. This clearly confirms the negative aspect of the Emmanuel sign. The similarity in language between verse 3 and 14 suggests to some that this child was the immediate fulfillment of that promise. In this case, it is before the child can speak clearly, which is three years of age, that Damascus, the capital of Syria, and Samaria, the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom. So you're not confused there. This is the time of division of Israel. Uh, would be plundered by the king of Assyria. Damascus fell to Assyria in 732 BC. Verses 5 through 8 explain this negative aspect further by predicting the attack of the Assyrians on Judah under the leadership of Sennacherib. However, it is not, it is as is common in the book of Isaiah, judgment is not um, the Lord Almighty's intended last word as the passage ends 8, 9 through 10 with the announcement of the, that Assyria herself will be judged. 8, 5 through 8, because Judah rejected Yahweh's seemingly gentle promises and instead rejoiced over what the Assyrians were going to do to Syria and Israel, God was going to bring the great Assyrian empire against them. Now this is where it gets awesome right here. 8.6. And let me read that back to you again. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. Uh, the NIV uh, commentary says, It's a metaphor for God's promises. Shiloh, the meaning of the name, is unclear. And when I read something like that, it immediately strikes a bell uh, with me. So I started digging around with the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh. Now let me tell you what I came across here. This is awesome. Okay, Shiloh. Local, locality mentioned in the Old Testament as the waters of Shiloh and the pool of Shiloh. Josephus writes the words, and they're in Greek, I can't read it. While the Arabic name is Ein Silwan, the pool was surrounded by the royal gardens to the south, and part of it belonged to the fortress of Jerusalem. While the spring which fed it was at the entrance to the Typhorian Valley, dividing the upper from the lower city. Probably as early as the reign of Solomon, water was brought from this spring to a tank in the valley of Kidron, in order to irrigate the royal gardens south of the city. Although this side of the reservoir, which Josephus calls Solomon's Pool, is no longer known, a conduit in which was discovered in the Siloam inscription led to it, led to it from the fountain of the Virgin, Ain Siti Maram, and though the outer part of Moriah to a pool in Typhorian Valley, it was probably to this conduit that Isaiah alluded to in speaking of the the, the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh that go softly. At the present time. 1905, the reservoir of Shiloh is 53 feet long and 18 feet wide and 19 foot deep. According to the Talmud, the spring in the, of the pool is exactly in the center of the Holy Land, and owning to its peculiar ebb and flow, it has always been popular, popularly regarded as the arm of the sea. Okay, it goes on from there, but just reading that, something struck me, a word in there. Siloam, and I started thinking about that, and that brought me to John, the book of John, <laughs> which is just awesome. The book of John, chapter 9, Jesus heals a man born blind. Let's take a look at that real quick here. As he was walking along, he observed a man who had been blind from birth. 
His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that caused him to be born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. This happened so that God's work might be revealed in him. I must do the work of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is approaching when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he spread the mud on the man's eyes and told him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated, Sent One. So he went off, washed, and came back, seeing. Now for those of you with eyes to see and ears to hear, you gathered what I did when I just read that to you. So let's go back to Isaiah. Because this people has rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. And flipping back over to John, again one more time. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent one. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. That is, that is goosebumps awesome, okay? That is, that is cool. And the fact that these guys that were with this commentary couldn't make these connections, just, I don't know. All praise, all thanks, all glory goes to Jesus Christ. Let's move on. 8-7 the words mighty in Euphrates, it's a metaphor for the king of Assyria. 8-8, eight, eight, reaching up to the neck, probably refers to Sennacherib's future attack, which captured the rest of Judah except Jerusalem. Um, the words your land, Emmanuel, suggest that, at the least, this is not ultimately an ordinary child, but one of royal lineage. 8-9-10, through 10, God's presence with his people would prevent the nation from carrying on the total destruction they planned. Verses 11 through 15, Yahweh sanctuary or stumbling block. These verses continue the thought of this section. If Yahweh is not made the central focus of one's life, then it becomes an obstruction over which one must be constantly, uh, one must constantly fall. Verses 11 through 13, two different understandings of this theory of two different understandings of history here. One give God the central place that only the Holy One must have, or to explain historical events as the result of human conspiracy with the constant dread of the unknown that this view engenders. Yahweh counsels Isaiah that he is going to dread something. It ought to be the Lord Almighty. See a reference in Matthew 10.28. So let's take a look at that. Matthew 10.28. Stop being afraid of those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Instead of Instead, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the body and the soul. But in the end, the fear of the Lord is not something defiling and demeaning. It is pure, as in Psalms 19.9, which says, The fear of the Lord is clean, standing forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are altogether righteous. It means ordering one's life around the Holy One's power, goodness, and reliability. Verses 14-15, the same God will be either a sanctuary, a holy place, or a snare, depending on the place God's people give him in their lives. For a similar thought, see Psalms 18, 24-26, which says, So the Lord restored me according to my righteousness, because my hands were clean in his sight. To the holy you show your gracious love, to the upright you show yourself upright, to the pure you show yourself pure and to the morally corrupt, you appear to be perverse. In verse 14, the words, a stone, stumble, a rock, fall. See Romans 9, 32 and 33, which says, Why not? Because they did not pursue it on the basis of faith. But as it were, based on achievements, they stumbled over that stone that causes people to stumble. As it is written, Look, I am placing a stone in Zion, over which people will stumble, a large rock that will make them fall, and the one who believes in him will never be ashamed, nor stumble for that matter.
um, 16 through 22, God's word or, uh, or the occult. Instead of seeking God's revelation, testimony, or instruction, as given to Isaiah and his disciples, the people turn to mediums and spiritists, in whom the light. As a result, they curse their king, and ironically, their God. And in so doing, they plunge themselves into utter darkness. In verse 17, the word wait, in Hebrew this is haka, my trust in, the Hebrew word is kawa, and depending on, translates in a variety of ways. Um, so let's just take a look here real quick. I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. So wait, the word wait, my trust in, could be trust, uh, trusted in, wait for, long for, hope in, hope in, look to, look for, look to, expect. Trusting God involves not rushing ahead of him to solve our problems in our own time, in our own way, with our own resources, but waiting for him to reveal how he plans to act. In verse 18, signs and symbols, Isaiah and his children, which perhaps includes Isaiah's disciples as well as his physical children, Sher, Jeshub, and Mer, Shalal, Hashbaz, were the evidence of the truth of all that the Lord Almighty had said. They represented faithfulness to God, and when the exile of the northern tribes and the devastation of Judah by the Assyrians occurred, Isaiah's words would be fully vindicated. So that does it for the NIV commentary and verses. Let's take a look over here at the Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry, uh, chapter 8. This chapter and the four that follow it are one continuous sermon, uh, broken into three parts. A prophecy of the destruction of the confederate kingdoms of Syria and Israel, verses 1 through 4. The desolation of the land of Israel and Judah, verses 5 through 8. And three, the great encouragement given to the prophet, verses 9 through 22. Exhortation and warnings, 1 through 8. Comfort for those who fear God, 9 through 16. Affliction to idolaters, 17 through 22. Uh, verses 1 through 8, the prophet is to write on a large roll or on a mint metal tablet, words which meant make speed to spoil, hasten to hasten to the prey, pointing out the Assyrian army should come with speed and make great spoil. Very soon the riches of Damascus and Samaria, cities that were secure and formidable at the time, shall be taken away by the king of Assyria. The prophet pleads with the promised Messiah who should appear in the land in the fullness in the fullness of time and therefore as God would preserve it in the meantime. And as a gentle brook is in an apt emblem of a mild government, so an overflowing torrent represents a conqueror and a tyrant. See, they just went right over it. They, uh, the Matthew Henry commentary didn't see this connection either. Anyway. The invader's success was also described by a bird of prey stretching its wings over the whole land. Those who reject Christ will find that they will. What they call liberty is the basis of slavery, but no enemy shall pluck the believer out of Emmanuel's hand or deprive him of his heavenly inheritance. 9-16, through 16, the prophet challenges the enemies of the Jews. Their efforts would be vain and themselves broken to pieces. It concerns us in the time of trouble to watch against all such fears and to put us upon crooked courses for our own security. The believing fear of God preserves against the disquieting fear of man. If we thought rightly of the greatness and glory of God, we should see all the power of our enemies restrained. The Lord, who will be a sanctuary to those who trust in him, will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who make the creature their fear and their hope. If the things of God be an offense to us, they will undo us. The Apostle quotes this as to all who persisted in, in the unbelief of the Gospel of Christ. 1 Peter 2.8, the crucified Emmanuel, who was, who was and is a stumbling stone and a rock of offense to the unbelieving Jews, is no less so to thousands who are called Christians. The preaching of the cross is foolishness in their esteem, in his doctrines and precepts, precepts offend them. Verses 17 through 22, 
The prophet foresaw that the Lord would hide his face, but he would look for his return in favor to them again. Though not miraculous signs, the children's names were memorials from God suited to excite attention. The unbelieving Jews were prone to seek counsel in difficulties from diviners of different descriptions whose foolishness, whose foolish and sinful ceremonies are alluded to. Would we know how to, would we know, would we know how we may seek to our God and come to the knowledge of his mind, to the law and to the testimony, for there you will see what is good and what the Lord requires. We must speak of the things of God in the words which the Holy Ghost teaches and be ruled by them. To those that seek to familiar spirits and regard not God's law and testimony, there shall be horror and misery. Those that go away from God go out of the way of all good, for fretfulness is a sin that it is its own punishment. They shall despair and see no way of relief when they curse God, and their fears will represent everything as frightful. Those that shut their eyes against the light of God's word will justly be left to utter darkness. All the miseries that ever were felt or witnessed on earth are as nothing compared with what will overwhelm those who leave the words of Christ to follow delusions. Amen. I kind of stumble on the Matthew Henry sometimes. It's written very much in the King Jamesian sort of language. And if you look at Matthew Henry's time frame, that makes sense. Uh, going over to the Wyclef. Messianic deliverance foreshadowed 8, 1 through 9, 7. Uh, breaks it down. The birth of a child foreshadowing the downfall of Judas' foes. God told Isaiah before he even had married his fiancée that he would have a man-child by her, and he bade him to inscribe the child's name on a tablet as a matter of public record before two witnesses of reputation, Mayor, Shalal, Hashbaz, meaning hasten to the booty, rush to the spoil, was to bestow, was to bestoken the successful Assyrian assault upon Damascus and Samaria. The, uh, this assault would crush both those kingdoms before the infant boy would be old enough to utter mommy or daddy, i.e. within three years. This prophecy was fulfilled in the capture of Damascus and the spoilation of Samaria in 732 by Tilgath Pleasure III. The Foolish Choice of Worldly Wisdom and Verses 5-8 through eight. 6. The waters of Shiloh or Siloam, a gentle healing spring in Jerusalem, typifying the reign of God in the yielded, yielded heart of the believer. The God-forgetting people were rejoicing in, or better, with respect to Rezin of Damascus and Pekka of Samaria, because they had been defeated by tilgath pileser Hence, this part of the chapter must have been written two or three years later than the episode of chapter 7. In verse 8, the words, O Emmanuel, were significant here. Yes, I, I, I see that too. Um, Isaiah's son was but a type of Emmanuel, God with us. The birth of the child may have evoked this thankful cry from the parents as they beheld the fulfillment of God's word. But from the time on, Israel became the land of promised redeemer. The messianic antitype of Mer Shalal Hashbaz. Though scorned by a Syrian invasion, it remained the land of promise because of the Messiah. Now, how awesome would that be? You know, you and your wife, um, the Lord tells you what to name your son, and it's a typification of the coming Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. I mean, that didn't get to happen in their lifetime, but they're, they're seeing it fulfilled, these things fulfilled in their, their lifetime. And to be able to name your, your sons this, I mean... How awesome, how awesome Isaiah's life must have been. Anyway, sorry. Uh, the last part, final triumph of God's grace, uh, verse 9. Through the pagan people do their worst in trying to extinguish Israel's light. They must eventually fall because God is with us, Emmanuel. Verse 12, Isaiah and his followers were not to be intimidated by the reproach of their countrymen. They were to be... They were guilty of conspiracy rather than confederacy against their country in opposing Ahaz's alliance with Assyria. Verse 13, no matter how unfavorable present circumstances are, true believers will sanctify Jehovah by continuing to regard him as supreme in governing human affairs and the fulfiller of his promises. They are to fear 
and revere him only. They are never to fear men. Verse 14, the apostates of Judah would stumble over his word, which they had spurned into destruction and damnation. Breaking off one more time, I have to here. We see this uh, culmination over and over again. Okay, They rejected uh, his warnings here in Isaiah. 777 years later, what is Jesus Christ? He is the rock and the stumbling block of the people right there in the same city where this is being typified here. 777 years before the rock and the stumbling block it's all laid before you and these people they do the same things over and over and over what is prophecy to the hebrew pattern pattern okay sorry uh the last part the faithful remnant to trust in god alone verse 16 now that isaiah's prophecy had been made public it was to be sealed up against the day of its fulfillment when god would authenticate it by the events of history Verse 18, the children whom Jehovah has given were, of course, Sher, Jeshub, and Meher, Shalal, Hashbaz, with their names and prophetic meaning. Hebrews 2.13 indicates that here Isaiah speaks of himself and his children as types of Christ in his blood, his blood-bought children, who are signs and wonders from the Lord. Verse 19, familiar spirits that wizards were much consulted in that age when people had lost their faith in the scriptures, like spiritists today. They are pretended to have communication with the dead, except that <laughs> these commentators here don't have a clue in, in that regards. Um, these people do communicate with the dead, people. Brothers and sisters, they are, and they're doing it right now. The thing is, though, is they're not communicating with who they think they're communicating with. They're communicating with demons, okay? Demons, anyway. And they do get, they do get uh, answers back from these demons. And some of them uh, may get uh, future events, and, and, and in some respects, those things may play out, they may not. You never know when you're consulting a demon. Anyway, verse 20, every human opinion, religion, or philosophy is valid only as it agrees with God's word. The only absolute yardstick of spiritual truth. 21 and 22, a description of the tragic disillusionment and despair of those who trust in something other than the word of God. There is no mourning or dawn or de of deliverance for them they shall plunge into the eternal night of perdition with vain and bitter curses upon their lips amen